got published last week, my um, I want to talk to you about then about my experience of writing. This is all the information you've seen. And this is my homepage on my website regarding my books. My whole website that I started developing right around the lockdown with COVID. I realized at that point that time's a waste and then I'm not going to live forever. So I got on it. And there's all kinds of links on here. I do a blog. I have um, a media page where I have links to presentations such as this one that I've taped or um, podcasts that I've done. Uh, information in here uh, about things I've written. I write a blog about, uh, I do several themes. One is the wisdom of the 12 steps. One is lesser known things that I've learned while I was on a travel trip. So I invite you to go do that. Here's how to contact me about, I mentioned this earlier, I've got more information there than you ever want to know about me. So as I talk about my writing experience, I'll talk about this uh, second memoir, Barbara Brothels and Bombs in the Night, and leave that in, and then I want to give you time at the end for questions. Um, if we don't finish by the time if I don't finish by the time the meeting is over, I'd be happy to stay a while and talk with you. But you can also reach me with my um, email address. And I would encourage you to tell me what you think about whatever. Um, okay, writing is a tough business. Not that many authors make money. Some do. They've got 20,000 books that they've published. Uh, but most, especially when they start, won't make a lot of money. It's a somewhat of a solitary experience. And so one way we get around that as writers, we go, we have critique groups, beta readers, we have editors and literary agents. Not that literary agents give you the best feedback. It's like, okay, not for us, thank you, bye. Um, which can lead to, well, negative feedback can lead to bouts of depression, but that's part of the, part of the course for a writer. Um, and so at some point, some, someone may have a manuscript and they get it published or they decide to throw it in the trash. But as Leonardo da Vinci said, ours is never finished, it's only abandoned. <laughs> so when you're writing a book, here are some things you need to keep in mind if you want people to read it. Pick a genre, I pick memoir, I like memoir. I kind of know all that as far as what I can remember. So I don't have, to, I, I, it, it's not like I have writer's block, it's just the willingness to write about it or not. Um, so both of my books are memoirs, and you can have more than one. A memoir is not an autobiography, it's only a little piece of your life. So I don't know how many a person can have, but technically a bunch. And then you have to find a theme. Okay, the second book is about surviving Vietnam, and I want to read you an excerpt from that to get you into theme. I heard a chapter entitled Welcome to Nam. We're beginning our descent into Tansanut, the pilot announced. Whoosh. A rush of warm humid air circulated through the cabin, carrying the smell of corrupted vegetation, a jungle of living and dying. Thick, heavy, and hidden in darkness, called the sense of suffocation. Constrained by my circumstances, and forced to remain buckled to my seat while being propelled into my unknown future, my lungs threatened to seize. My throat threatened to slam shut. Every cell of my body wanted to deny reality. Before the plane rolled to a stop, the sergeant started. If we encounter incoming rounds, keep moving until you're off the plane and get to a bunker or hit the deck. His instructions, straightforward, amounted to a no bones about it slap in the face. As if those words weren't enough, he delivered another swift kick in the ass. The plane's engines lost the mic. The plane's engines will continue running. Once we're off an ongoing group boards, this plane will leave. That comment extinguished the last possibility of my escaping Nam. Reality had come home to roost. You ain't in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. 
However unrealistic my hopes had been, there was no way around the fact that I'd arrived in Nam and wasn't leaving anytime soon. And it wasn't like I thought I'd hide in the plane's laboratory or cargo hold. And that chapter goes on. I'll stop there. If you like that. Yes, please. I don't know what happened, but it's weird. Battery went dead. Oh, okay. Such as technology, which is wonderful, except when it isn't. Yeah. Okay. So then, one good thing about one one thing an author wants to do is to choose an inciting incident that is what propels the author to write the story. And hopefully that propels the reader into wanting to read the story. So I'd like to read you another excerpt on that that I consider an inciting incident for me. And this is like the first chapter. My walk down the hallway and up the stairs of the psychology department building at Western Kentucky University carried me past the gauntlet of invisible ghosts from my past. Can't be late, how much longer can I hold on? My heart pounded in my ears. I avoided eye contact with people I passed along the way and hoped, oh. okay, my back on, on. yeah, you yeah. are, okay, my back on and hoped nobody recognized me. I entered the counseling center office, not sure what to expect. Once inside, I informed a receptionist, I have an appointment, take a seat, the girl behind the reception counter said with a smile. She picked up a phone and said with a cheery voice, your 11 o'clock is here. <laughs> what is she so happy about? I checked my surroundings, noticing a few chairs, magazines on a table, brochures in a rack on the wall by the entrance, and bright overhead fluorescent lights. The doors to several interior offices were closed. I felt a gentle breeze of cool air and heard piped in music. The place smelled antiseptic, a typical reception area. I couldn't concentrate on the music or the magazines. Couldn't concentrate on a simple thing other than my recycled thoughts of misery. Several minutes passed before a plump, salt and pepper haired woman appeared. She maintained a gentle gaze. My name is Alfie, she said. Let's go back to my office. I followed her for a short walk to her inner sanctum. She offered me a chair, then seated behind her desk, asked me, why are you here? I took a deep breath. I've got to start somewhere. I thought I could put Nam behind me, but I guess not. That and a girlfriend just dumped me. I can't handle it all. At the age of 23, I hoped to set aside the wreckage of my head-on collision with the realities I faced in Vietnam. Hoped I could lay those ghosts to rest, though now they were resurfacing. Adding to the isolation and loneliness I experienced over the fresh loss of a girlfriend. At least I considered her my girlfriend. Thought though she didn't want to be mine at that point. I'd been plunged into turmoil. Everything churned, threatening to overwhelm and consume me, and ideas of suicide grew in frequency and intensity. So hopefully that serves to explain to people why the book is written. And from there I launch into the whole story of how I got to that point, the counseling office. In the process, um, early on, an author wants to have a hook, and that's kind of like a teaser. You've probably known about that if you've done any advertising at all, or any kind of promotion. Uh, the teaser will um, pique an interest of a potential reader or a customer. And then you want to develop the story and character. Now, I did it mostly chronologically. Not all people do that. Not all books are written that way. Not all movies are done that way. Sometimes they're back and forth in, in the time frame. And then once you have something written, you get it published. And there are possibilities, and I'm not going to go through these, but there's traditional publisher, hybrid publisher, which I utilize. Self-publishing, although hybrid publisher is self-publishing. A hybrid publisher, you pay them to do the heavy lifting for you, and self-publish, you do it on your own. But let me tell you, there is a lot to do. It's complex, it's compounded, it's fraught with all kinds of problems. 
I thought I was going to get this book published early this year, like February, but there was a delay of this, delay of that, delay of that, and it's like, oh my goodness, when am I going to get it done? And the last option is you give it away, put it, post it on social media, or mail it to your relatives, and that's going to be that. <laughs> there are some of the things my hybrid publisher did. Of course, I was involved in that the whole time, and I had creative control. I'm not going to go through all that. Now comes the marketing. Well, that's when you launch the book. Now, if you're a traditional publisher, will do some of this for you, but not all of it. Regardless of whether an author goes to a, pub a traditional publisher, they do everything on their own, or they have a hybrid publisher, they have to market. It's just the nature of the game. Nowadays, at least. Um, so here are all the possibilities of things that people can do, and it just goes on and on. And they're we're at 15. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, selling a book. Uh, I can sell it myself. Sometimes I can sell a few online copies. It's available in various places, like um, Amazon. Um, and then there are retail sellers, like Charles's books, and Barnes and Noble's online, and on and on and on. And again, it's just almost an endless list. And then there's uh, digital versions called ebooks. And if you Google my name or you Google my book's title, you may come up with an arm's long list of places you can go look for it. It's just phenomenal how much the information will spread around the internet once you start putting it on there someplace. <laughs> the problem is the number of books that are out there. I just picked this off the web a couple of years ago uh, when my first book was launched. So as of August 2010, uh, Google estimated there were over 129 million books in print. That is, for all languages, all um, cultures around the world at that time. Uh, there, never been, there may have been duplicated titles because you can't copyright a title. But can you imagine if that's on your, let me just tell you, if that's your to-do list, you'll never get it done. And now in 22, I just looked up this figure uh, right before the launch of my second book here, and I was blown away. Four million plus in one year. It is phenomenal. So there's a lot of competition to get your book out there to public so that they know. If they don't know about it, if they don't read about it, they don't hear about it, they don't see anything about it, they don't know it's there. They won't read it. I an opportunity. Okay, a little bit of a quiz. We don't need to go through all this, but what's the debut author? Their first book. What are beta readers? I mentioned that earlier. It was on the slide. Beta readers, somebody that like beta testing a, an application or a software program. They will look at your book, they critique it for you and say, this is where I liked it, this is where it fell flat, blah, blah, blah. And so if authors um, do themselves a service if they have beta readers. They're pre-testing the market. I'm sure some of you who are in marketing know what that is, pre-testing. What are scare quotes? Oh, let me get back to my big page. What are scare quotes? Anybody know? This one. They're right there. Every word. Those are scare quotes. That's what authors use to highlight a word. Now some people will say that's not a good idea to do that because the author loses credibility when they do that. It kind of softens the impact of the word. I don't necessarily agree to that, but anyway. Learn something new every day, huh? Um, What's writer's block? You hear about that sometimes. If you're a writer, you hear about it, you may say, I experienced it. Writer's block is kind of when your head gets jammed and you don't know what to do next. I don't believe it's true. The way to get around writer's block for an author, sit down and write anything that comes to your mind. Just be spontaneous. And your writer's block will disappear. You'll start writing something and it will lead to something else and something else and something else. And something else. Um, what's a favicon? You know those little images you see across the bar when you 
go to web pages and you get more and more websites open and they, the space gets tinier and tinier. At some point you lose the name, but you have a little image, that's the favicon. Uh, I think we might see it again in a minute. Okay. And what's the deepest? I like that word. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when you're uh, when a writer is going on in a story, they'll break a timeline. There'll be a gap of time, and they'll use a dinkus to indicate there's a break in time. Oh, yes. A dinkus is three little asterisks in a row on sure. the page. Some people use um, what are they call number signs. What's the word? Uh, Outside hashtags. Some people use hashtags. I don't particularly like that. I, I like the think it's better. Okay, now for the quiz. Okay. Now, I will read one more excerpt. Oh, guess what? There's my dinkus. I mean, there's my favorite con. Right there. Oh, okay. Sure. All right. Um, this is the kind of the summation for the ending, and actually, I, I entitled that the afterword. Following my graduation from WKU, I immigrated to California, where I earned an MA in marriage, family, and child counseling. Then worked in the field of alcohol drug rehabilitation. And over a number of years, while assisting others in their recovery processes, I had opportunity to gain a healthier perspective on emotional expression through catharsis. While in the Army in Vietnam, I, I'd stumbled my way toward manhood while exploring the use of alcohol, drugs, sex, and anger in an attempt to survive a year in a strange world where I never wanted to be. And additionally, trauma having many faces, I'd struggled to deal with the path on which mine took me. All of our Vietnam service personnel, both men and women, for that matter, all veterans everywhere and whenever, suffered trauma, I believe. No doubt, some have overcome the worst of their issues, though some have not. And then there are those who have succumbed to theirs. Though exact figures of Vietnam vet suicides are not available, all U.S. veteran suicides averaged 6,000 per year over the 10 year span of 2008 to 2017. That's 60,000. And by the way, that was more than we lost in Vietnam. Yes. I want to say to all veterans, welcome home. And to everyone struggling with their version of trauma, regardless of its source, you don't need to face your demons alone. Okay. So, I think we're, we're how, how are we doing, Scott? Probably about seven, seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay. So you can contact me through these things, and I'd love to hear feedback, but again, I'm doing a few things. I'm trying to, I'm wanting to educate you some about the writing experience, some in particular about my writing experience, let you know about, I've got books available, so I'm marketing and promoting at the same time. No obligation on your part, but I've got books that you can purchase or to read. Uh, I, have a, I do a quarterly newsletter just to working on my fan, quote, quote unquote, scare quotes, fan base that I will send to people on a quarterly basis, no charge, and it just kind of ups, updates everyone on what I'm up to and what I'm doing. Um, what else? And then feel free to take a business card. I've got some back there too with the books in the uh, quarterly newsletter sign up sheet. I'm trying to think if there's anything else, but if not, uh, entertain questions or comments from anybody. So, sure. uh, writing obviously is a job. So, how much time per day, or do you do per day or per week, do you spend on it? Okay, good question. Well, you have to think of it as a job if you're serious about doing it. I realize that. That's Earlier on, I didn't think of it as a job. It was more like an interest in something I wanted to do, which I still have. But um, to do, to be a good writer, wh whether you have the innate ability or not, like anything else, you need to practice and look at it over time. Um, when I was really into the throes of 
finishing writing this. Uh, Janet, my wife, she's mad, will say, you know, you disappear all day long. I don't, you know, she knows I'm up writing, but I'm doing my solitary thing and she's left on her own. So it's like mm -hmm. I have a job. And I may sit there from after breakfast at 10 o'clock and go till 4 o'clock. Well, excuse me, with the exception of taking a short lunch break for a sandwich or something. And, and then other days I may be sitting there writing something and it's 7 o'clock and she calls me on the phone and says, dinner is ready. <laughs> so I can get into it. Time, you lose time when you're on a computer, that's my experience anyway. Particularly when I'm writing something I'm interested in or if I'm editing or re-editing something. So I'd say probably 30 hours a week, uh, sometimes more. And it, it just depends on where I'm at with a particular piece or something I'm interested in doing. Now, if I'm doing presentations like this, of course, that's factored in there instead of being at the computer right now on here and in the view. But it's still about the same amount of time, regardless of what I'm doing. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? David. Covered. You can only speak for yourself here, but I can see there's a substantial amount of work and, and creativity that's involved in being an author here, and you've given me and all of us great insights into that. Talk about your own motivations. What causes you to write? What causes you to write books that you want to go out and publish? What's the, the main motivational factor for you? Is it because you wish to become successful as an author, 20,000 or more sales, or is, what else? Is, is what's involved here for you? Um, that's a good question. Motivation to me is a multifaceted thing, and I'm not sure any of us ever really know. We can give an answer, but that, that may not be the full, probably isn't the full story. I'm a scientist, I understand. And it may be one day is my motivation that I'm aware of, and I'll tell you, but ask me tomorrow, and that could be different. Sure. I think part of it was feeling the joy of being able to describe a scene, and if somebody else saw it, read it, or heard about it, say, ooh, that really puts me there. And I'm feeling that impact of having that ability to pre recreate something that I can do with written words that will resonate in a person's imagination and mind. Um, for, in some way for both, in some way why I do the memoir, uh, is a catharsis, although I've done a lot of that emotionally early on, in particular, this uh, memoir, I think putting things on paper in words, getting it out of here, putting it on paper, helps solidify it in a way that does not occur if you don't write it. If you think about it, even if you talk about it with people, it's not the same as writing it. It's almost as if you're putting it in concrete. Not that you can't change that, but somehow it crystallizes it and, and brings it into better focus. Um, in my first book, not that I <clears throat> consciously did this early on, um, I wanted to acknowledge my grandmother, my mother, um, for their unconditional blood and acceptance of me, which is what I think pulled me through the trauma years for me. I also wanted to acknowledge the help I got from the other extended family members, a la It Takes a Village. Uh, I learned something from everybody. And then at some point I, I got to the juncture, not that I did it when I was writing the book, to really accept that my father, who was the abusive, rageaholic, um, alcohol binging member of my family, he was a victim too. He was a victim of his PTSD from World War II, and I think he was a victim from his childhood growing up with my grandfather, who I think was also an alcoholic, and probably a rageaholic himself. So there's a lot of facets of the, of the motivation there. Um, and what you saw it in the first page, um, the quote from Winston Churchill, fear is a reaction, courage is a decision. And somewhere along the way, I decided that rather than live with the fear, I wanted to live with the courage. In spite of having the fear, and just go for it, and put it out there. Part of that is my therapist wanting to connect with people, not only for me personally, but just connect with me from that level, and that maybe they also 
would find some solace and some hope in that, what my words. And I have another quote from Brene Brown, and I can't quote her exactly, I'll paraphrase it. You will write your story of what happened to you, and it will become someone else's survival guide. And so there's the long-winded answer to your question, but certainly not complete. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, One more talk. Anybody else has any questions? Can we, uh, I got one, one, one quick question. Now that you're a published author, would you consider going to audiobooks or, or how do you feel about audiobooks? Uh, I think they're a good avenue. However, to do a quality audiobook, you, you either need to have good, very good equipment or you need to find somebody who's a professional to, to uh, record it for you and maybe even actors to play the various characters to make it alive for people. Otherwise, it sounds like a, a drone, somebody droning on, and you don't want that. 